uh, our next speaker is Andre Waddington by Crow. Uh, he's a graduate student at University of Zurich, Switzerland. His work is focused on extrapolating a theory of escape from Wittgenstein's view on language. Previously, she was at Alanda University in Biha working on comparative ethics. As an uh, undergraduate, he studied at uh, George Washington University in DC, where he double majored in international affairs, security policy, and uh, philosophy uh, public affairs. Uh, I hope I introduce you rightly. If I'm wrong, please correct me. And today, his talk is on the linguistic challenge from Wittgenstein's form of life. Okay, welcome, Andre. Thank you. Um, is my presentation uh, visible to you all at this moment? Okay, so um, initially I was uh, planning on working on Wittgenstein's forms of life or form of life, if you prefer. Um, throughout my uh, exposure of primary and secondary literature, I would definitely have to defer to form of life as a singular term. And I'll also attempt to justify this to some extent. So um, here there might be some sort of uh, arguments that are not necessarily sequentially related to each other. Again, given that this was intended to be a broader project and it was later on condensed as a paper. Uh, the vast majority of the literature, at least to my exposure of Wittgenstein's notion of form of life, has been in regards to a debate between monism and pluralism on one hand and naturalism and transcendentalism on the other. There's work such as von Compagni's that kind of try to enunciate the combinatorial possibilities of such positions. Uh, secondly, I, should, uh, I shall also look at Peter Hacker's view of the autonomy of grammar and provide a complementary explanation to what I thought, at least to, to that uh, extent that uh, it, it could provide not only a clear understanding of what it means to have a norm of representation and the process following a, a rule, but also if perhaps there is some sort of normative component to this. And I'm also quite aware that the, the majority of Wittgensteinians are non-cognitivists when it comes to uh, Wittgenstein's action theory or position on ethics. So to that extent, I know this position would have been uh, a minority position. And lastly, um, I um, also wanted to contextualize Wittgenstein's view of form of life as a religious notion, particularly in the space of religious epistemology. Uh, so firstly, to begin with this discussion of monism and pluralism, is there a single human for, uh, form of life which is internal function to our biological aggregate, or are there many forms of life which differ from one culture to another? And um, on the other hand, I would also like to kind of explain that the transcendentalists seem to hold this position that forms of life are an innate idea sui generis with its own unique bounds of semantic assessment and assertability. The naturalists, however, on the other hand, seem to frame the debate as strictly within empirical explanations, namely anything that could be conceived and explained uh, via linguistic mechanisms about the form of life have to be somehow restricted to empirical investigation. So the central argument that, that I attempt to defend is that uh, the clearest way and perhaps the most persuasive way to uh, understand and explain Wittgenstein's use of form of life is via Stanley Cavell's methodology, uh, which um, seems to be some sort of hybrid position between naturalism and monism. With this in mind, given that Wittgenstein uh, tends to emphasize particularities there is this kind of thematic question of, are there any hidden universals within the particularities of form of life? Uh, and uh, Stanley Cavell would definitely say that there are some underpinning notions of such uh, uh, unity. So uh, regarding Wittgenstein's metaphilosophy, uh, there are some, some uh, majority views such as uh, Wittgenstein's philosophy can be merely read as therapeutic for us to be able to let the fly out of the fly bottle, for example. Uh, since we know we will not engage on a lot of topics uh, in, uh, in kind of an agreement way, and perhaps we shall uh, not ever agree since there might not be right answer to some philosophical questions, philosophy can only aid our ability to interact with ourselves and the external world. Uh, here you could also perhaps defer to J.L. Austin's uh, uh, paper, A Plea for Excuses. On the other hand, naturalists would take the stance that philosophical problems, be it in the space of metaphysics or elsewhere, are indeed real, hence solvable. So it's not mere speculation or some sort of conceptual proliferation in that sense to expand our, 
schema of beliefs and so forth. Philosophy as an active practice cannot be spoon-fed. One must arrive at their own particular conclusive remarks in light of linguistic investigation towards the application of concepts. Uh, I'm going to argue that Wittgenstein did indeed make positive claims. He did make arguments and they weren't mere methodical claims in that sense. Uh, at least for the introductory aspect of it, uh, I found Floyd's uh, work quite persuasive as far as understanding some of the fundamental notions of a of, uh, form of life. So her emphasis, at least in, in one of the articles in Nordic Wittgenstein Review, seems to be emphasizing ideas of aspect and technique, which are salient for approximating how Wittgenstein himself might have conceived of this notion. The deference to language games as objects of analogous reasoning is also echoed in philosophical investigation, where Wittgenstein alludes at common properties of games and languages themselves. Understanding languages as dynamic expressions of human life and linguistic practices is a helpful investigative tool towards the relationship of forms of life as well. In philosophical investigation, we see here, I mean, the, the Wittgenstein's exposure of form of life or forms of life or what have you appears very rarely throughout all of his mature writings. Uh, there, and uh, one of them here is that the word language game is used here to emphasize the fact that speaking of language is part of an activity or a form of life. This also seems to be one of the most uh, interesting ways in which Wittgenstein discusses form of life because it has led to a diversity in the literature, whether or not this should be read as some sort of uh, anthropological notion or um, something biological. Floyd also emphasizes that we as humans are conceptually gifted creatures. The active engagement in utterances is a process of binding. It is an ongoing process of identifying the correct use of conceptual relations in such a way that we disambiguate our use of language. Uh, before I uh, kind of move on to really explain what the relativistic position really is in this debate, uh, I would like to open with uh, some sort of criticism towards the notional use of relativism itself. Uh, the idea of relativism here implies that there are hermetic walls between ideas. This cannot be achieved with the use of relativism. Wittgenstein himself must go beyond language games as the foundation of speech and grammar. Collective practices lead to uniform regularities over time, which are forwardly embedded in our form of life. This embedding process in turn structures our human life and shows us the combinatorial possibilities of thinking, binding, and conceiving in an interdependent manner. The clearest method for comparative analysis is an emphasis on the notion of interdependence rather than simply relational or its resembling cousin relativism. Relativism can still imply some sort of irreconcilable difference. Interdependence, on the other hand, is a notion that acknowledges differences and shows respect towards the understanding of plurality. Additionally, interdependence provides a conceptual contribution to a broader and holistic picture of the internal properties that link or connect ideas or practices. Collective practices lead to uniform regularities over time, which are forwardly embedded in our form of life. This embedding process in turn structures our human life and shows us the combinatorial possibilities of thinking, binding, and conceiving in an interdependent manner. Next, we have Hunter's uh, in, uh, four interpretations of the form of life. First, the form of life is a component of our human lives, a mediation tool throughout which systems of thought and behavior, however contingent they may be, are continuously animating human activities. Secondly, he says, every form of life is some sort of behavioral package directly associated with some sort of language game. Thirdly, a form of life is a building block of culture, be it in a religious or linguistic fashion. And lastly, a form of life is an organic or biological phenomenon that is inseparable from our human existence. The, la the last interpretation is what Hunter himself holds to be the case. Um, we should also perhaps make a distinction between transcendentalism and naturalism in an additional sense, because both monists and pluralists have their own divergences over this discussion. Transcendentalist uh, monists would hold that Wittgenstein's mystical rhetoric and analysis in some passages can lead us to conceive of a single form of life with some supernatural, or at least not subject to empirical investigation, properties and implications. Secondly, the naturalist would say that a form of life is a unitary aspect of our human experience. Different species have their own particular form of life, which is relative to their taxonomical classification. Our human form of life is shaped by our biological and evolutionary experience, alongside a recognizable pattern in our human natural history. Uh, Kind of my imputation in this debate, it seems that the transcendentalists tend to defer to Kantian literature and the naturalists tend to defer to Humean literature. This is a general claim, not necessarily an all-encompassing claim. However, it does seem to me at least that 
this kind of debate of transcendentalism and natural in Wittgenstein has been taken as an additional opportunity for Humeans and Kantians to find uh, additional justifications for their own positions prior to reading Wittgenstein in the first place. As for pluralism, I defer to Hanyo Glock's uh, distinction. Firstly, there are the extreme pluralists. There are different, indefinitely many forms of life, and the same can be said about language games. Every language game has its own form of life. This position uh, is not particularly common in contemporary literature. Uh, this presentation is primarily going to focus on the latter one, which is the modern pluralists, which say that there is more than one human form of life. There are also less forms of life than language games. Each culture has its own form of life in addition to however many language games are contained within that particular culture. As far as transcendental monism, I'll primarily look at Baker first. So Baker necessitates some sort of transcendence, the primary observation akin to a position of epistemic idealism. We cannot ostensibly teach the form of life. They are mind-dependent notions. There is nothing in the external world which, can be point, which we can point to for the purpose of engaging in a meaningful discussion about the form of life. The same cannot be said about colors or animals, for example. The second observation addresses an asymmetry between the practice of language and the entities to which they refer. Baker says, uh, although the use of concepts of independently existing objects depends on practice, it does not follow that the things to which the concepts apply likewise depend on practice. The fact that the existence of human concepts can be somewhat generally equated with the existence of a great variety of human linguistic practices, and then uh, she kind of uh, turns towards this view that there, there must be some sort of uh, innate unity of apprehension similar to how Kant uh, per he perceives grammar that kind of binds uh, contradictory uh, positions in our own mind and hence we must defer to some sort of transcendental explanation. Lear, on the other hand, says that given the manifold of perceptions that the human mind can experience in addition to the plurality of divergent views that accompany such a manifold, there must be an eye consciousness which synthesizes the plurality of representations and their respective content. Additionally, Lear argues that the inner grasping of a rule is different from the outer or behavioral one and the unity of apprehension is connecting these remarks. And uh, th th this is supposed to show some sort of unity of diversity at uh, uh, some sort of logical necessity for them uh, holding, uh, for the mind uh, having to hold some sort of monistic uh, framework of perceiving and conceiving in order to actually make sense of the use of all these concepts in our belief schema. So my response to the transcendental monists is that, first of all, regarding Baker's piece, it seems that uh, she, uh, she later on kind of turns around her own argument and she says, well, forms of life actually has no, have no explanatory value whatsoever. But throughout the paper, it seemed that she was making positive arguments as to what, it, what a form of life really means. So in that sense, it, it seems like a, a contradictory standard. Uh, secondly, the mind-dependent argument does not show any sort of metaphysical necessity for transcendence. We can have uh, mainly her explanation without some sort of uh, process of deferring to uh, Kantian notion of transcendence. And also, I would like to defend Glock's response, as, and this applies to all sorts of transcendental positions as far as uh, Wittgenstein's reading of form of life is concerned, which is that he provides two reasons that distinguish Wittgenstein from Chomsky's linguistic paradigm and other evolutionary psychologists. Firstly, we cannot understand linguistic practices through our reference only to neurolinguistic phenomena. And secondly, language is a communal activity, hence any description that does not include social formations is incomplete and insufficient. Next, I am going to look at Newton Garver's position. Uh, he is actually quite difficult to categorize in that sense, but it would likely also be unfair to say that Garver was not fond of categories given that he was a trained Kantian scholar, uh, but he tends to kind of merge interesting positions together and hold some sort of view that is naturalistic. However, he does defer to Kant to explain some empirical phenomena, so it is nonetheless questionable what exactly was Garver's position. With these things in mind, nonetheless, Gar uh, Garver says, Wittgenstein's naturalism is, however, richer than Strassen's because his natural history of human comprises grammar, language games, and our complicated form of life. These human activities involve norms. Some sort of norms of language are arbitrary, and this naturalism, therefore, contains the seeds of normativity and of certain sorts of transcendence of the merely empirical and merely factual. 
Secondly, the view that our human form of life encapsulates our activities, beliefs, and so forth is compatible with the anthropological reading that a form of life also has cultural implications. These are likely some of the, the major takeaways that we should have from Garver. Firstly, human activities involve the presence of norms. This observation shall be further expanded on. And secondly, the human form of life encompasses the natural history of humanity, which also tends to be quite uh, uncontroversial as far as perhaps all possible positions on form of life are concerned. With this in mind, however, I would also like to point out that there is no such thing as an inflexible biological notion. Natural selection occurs because our biological aggregates are flexible and contingent. As a result, our human form of life is also temporally contingent to the global, social, political, and ecological system we choose to maintain as a human species. Uh, moving on to transcendental uh, pluralism, uh, Gear uh, tends to show some sympathy towards Cavell's writing that there must be some sort of compatibility between the anthropological and biological. However, Gear decides that the pluralistic reading uh, is more persuasive. Gear also finds parallels with Kant's reasoning, specifically that Wittgenstein's forms of life seem to be similar to Kant's Bedingungen der Mogle. Moglichkeit der Erfahrung, which are the conditions for the possibility of existence. Williams also shares Gear's transcendental intuitions. However, he defers to a justification from the Tractatus, namely the, in, uh, the famous line that the limits of our language are the limits of our world. Moderate pluralism, on the other hand, tends to be uh, a quite popular view is also held by uh, Baker, Hacker, as well as Hanyu Glock, which is that the pluralists operate under this presumption that every culture is a unique set of combinatorial possibilities of behaviors, beliefs, desires, and whatever else may constitute a culture. At the same time, Wittgenstein himself does not give a clear criteria for the foundation of culture, which is one of the criticisms that I have towards uh, an exaggerated emphasis on the cultural denotations of forms of life. Every language and in turn, every culture borrows customs, utterances, and belief structures over time from their respective neighbors and other civilizations they have come in contact with. Cultures themselves have dependently originated during the vast natural history of humanity. And this notion of dependent origination is quite inspired uh, from uh, Buddhist philosophy. I did not directly uh, defer to it altogether, but I definitely felt that it was salient towards really understanding the idea that there, there is no such thing as this unique monolithic entity, this sort of Cartesian fortress of mind that, that is impenetrable or impermeable by other, form, by other uh, forms of human activities. However, the view that every culture has its own form of life does not entail some difficult implications. Firstly, it presumes that cultures are monolithic entities that can become more intelligible by placing them in contrast to other cultures. Although the later claim is reasonable insofar as it has the former presumption as an antecedent, the anthropological method defers to relativism over interdependence. Relativists alienate throughout the formation of their arguments. They create a discourse and debate culture where it is permissible to alienate universal human conduct and undervalue similarities under the guise of philosophical anthropology. Um, I'm also indeed aware that not all people that favor the position of this uh, cultural uh, relativism in Wittgenstein are Quinians. However, uh, they do have at least some minimal commitments to what Quine has to say about these sorts of um, fuzzy anthropological pro projects, which is why this criticism should still uh, be interesting. So Cavill's justification is what I found most persuasive and I, and I would like to defend, which is that we can look at the human form of life without a deference to a transcendental explanation. Cavill's distinction of the biological denotation being the vertical sense and the ethnological denotation as the horizontal sense provides a good analogy for how these two paradigms can be compatible. They each have their own instrumental value. However, we understand them both not simply in distinction to each other, but also as a pair. A bird needs both of its wings to fly. A naturalist monist does not have to be re as restrictive as Hunter's organic account, nor as disposed to offer a compromise with the transcendental notion such as Carver's either. A monistic naturalistic reading of Wittgenstein does not necessitate a commitment to biological reductionism. Uh, secondly, uh, it seems that they have roughly 10 minutes, so I am not going to have the time to also cover the third aspect of religious epistemology. Feel free to, uh, to read the paper if you have any curiosities towards that, but I shall try to summarize as, as clearly as I can, and perhaps even on a slower pace, this view of autonomy of grammar and how I try to offer a complementary view to hackers. So, um, 
hacker kind of makes this uh, this move that um, some the norms of representation are not truth app they're not about truthness or falsehood and in, in, in the logical sense but but rather that uh, he says that there is no such thing as justifying grammar as correct by reference to reality grammar is not answerable to reality in the currency of truth the rules of grammar have an arbitrary component, meaning that names themselves contain their meaning in virtue of the practice of a linguistic community. There is nothing inherent in the hue of red, nor any physical property of redness may have, which makes the English-speaking community have to call it red. Reality does not provide a mechanism of correctness for grammar. There is nothing inherently necessary to our process of conceptual formation as far as the designative process is concerned. The autonomy of grammar is not only an explanation for the process of the formation of conventions and a display of the bounds of a particular language game, but it also shows the overall, the functional properties of language itself. Hacker uh, extends this uh, uh, reading to also show some sort of empirical uh, uh, and utilitarian sort of view of what it really means to, to use language in the way in which we do. Uh, language is also constrained in a good way by physical and empirical limitations. We do not play chess with pieces heavier than we can lift, nor do we use notations which we cannot survey. These constraints are clearly an advantage to our linguistic practices. They show the utilitarian aspect of grammar and utterances. The bounds of sense are directly affected by uh, convenience, intelligibility, and use. The usefulness itself of a practice is determined by the practical constraints in which the sphere of activities is contained and performed. Uh, I find Hacker's explanation of the autonomy of grammar quite compelling, and uh, my ambition was to offer a complementary response to uh, his project, namely that Insofar as human agreement sustains grammar by practices of forming, maintaining, and eventually revising conventions, normative conduct too can follow a similar line of reasoning. Akin to how no physical property of redness tells us how to morphologically construct the designation for the hue, if there were such a thing as real moral objects, these objects would not be able to tell us anything about how to conceive them, nor how to construct conventions around them. Secondly, this consistency of our behavior, speech, and mental acts are the recurring activities in which we find the necessary uniformity to ascribe, describe, and prescribe linguistic rules. Hacker describes these regularities as an anthropological phenomena rooted in human behavior. Thirdly, I will argue that this normative component necessary for agreement in representations is a tool in the multiplicity of our language games, which function more than a mere semantic norm. Insofar as human agreement sustains grammar by practicing, forming and maintaining and eventually revising conventions, normative conduct too can follow a similar line of reasoning, akin to how no physical property of redness tells us how to morphologically construct the designation for a hue. Oh, I apologize. This is uh, th this was repeated. Okay, let's see. So let's go to uh, Wittgenstein's exegesis as to why I think not only the hacker was right in his uh, uh, format of describing the autonomy of grammar, but also perhaps offered a complementary explanation. So in the foundations of mathematics, uh, Wittgenstein states that it is of the greatest importance that a dispute hardly ever arises between people about whether the color of this object is the same as the color of that. The length of this rod, the same as the length of that, etc. This peaceful agreement is the characteristic surrounding of the use of the word same. Next, in culture and value, he states that the origin and the primitive form of the language game is a reaction. Only from this can the more complicated forms grow. Language, I want to say, is a refinement. In the beginning was the deed, which is likely also a reference to Goethe's uh, work Faust. Next, in philosophical investigation, he says that, how am I able to follow a rule? If this is not a question about causes, then it is about the justification for my acting in this way in complying with the rule. And uh, I would really like to stress this if here, uh, because he doesn't completely exclude the discourse of causality per se. He just offers a potential alternative explanation in this sense. And I'm uh, going to attempt to explain why there might be some sort of interesting implications for perceiving such uh, normative rules of representation as a social effect. So uh, 
uh, you know, philosophers tend to come up with their own kind of unique words. So as far as my contribution to this sort of grammatical project, insofar as it is clear, interesting, or persuasive, I uh, developed this notion of salva regula, which I would say it is a necessary norm of representation. We should visit Hacker briefly for a second. So Hacker says, having a length is an internal property of rods. If something lacks a length, it is not rod. And if a rod ceases to have a length, it will cease to be a rod. Similarly, internal relations are conceived to be essential to the identities of their relata. Red is darker than pink. If a color lighter than pink, it cannot be red. Necessary propositions, we have always been told, describe the essential features of the world. Every identity statement semantically entails its negation as well. The utterance of word red already includes a process of conceivability in which the agreement in representation also entails that what we mean by red is the exclusion of every other hue that is darker than red and every other hue that is brighter than it. The same of an object entails not only its properties, but also the linguistic bounds in which it is sensible and correct to use that particular name. The argument of salva regula shall be full, further elaborated as this necessity of normativity for the functional use of language. This surely has interesting modal implications for the use of language and the cognitive activity undergone by the brain when processing direct perception of hues, as well as the overall cognitive architecture supporting both linguistic production and interpretation. This little side note here was primarily intended to further be elaborated upon as to why naturalistic monism is also more persuasive from an empirical point of view when we look at modern psychology, when we look at people that are bilinguals or uh, poly, polylinguals to some, some great extent as how they still share some sort of fundamental human form of life when they undergo the transition from one language to another. So here is the formulation of salva regula. Firstly, all descriptive statements are meaningful. They do not have to be a correct representation in that sense, but they have to be at least meaningful in some sense. Secondly, all, exploration, all explanations too are meaningful since Wittgenstein in some obscure passages attempted to make a distinction between uh, description and explanation. Thirdly, descriptions and explanations make sense because of rules of representation, which is more or less uh, a summary of Hacker's view. Fourthly, the property of rules that make the first and the second premise possible meaningful is a norm. Two conclusions can be drawn from this. Firstly, all utterances have some, have some sort of normative property. And uh, secondly, therefore, all statements are normative. Here by normative, we do not necessarily have to entail normative in the sense of this must be the case or uh, some sort of deontic view of it is uh, necessarily obligatory for such and such norm to be enacted or or be enforced to use a Glock's um, kind of view. However, it does mean that every utterance does carry some sort of normative aspect to it. The rules of a language game make complete sense to us because we have restricted bounds of options within the game. We have drawn these boundaries for a special purpose, the purpose of making sense to us as a linguistic community. We can understand chess correctly due to the finite rules that it has, as well as the finite options within the game itself. By constructing conventions around the game of chess, for example, which is also contingent, we restrict the options that are acceptable for a chess player to perform. These boundaries provide the, dy the dynamic modes of comparison both directly and internally to the rules themselves. We can compare on one hand the moves of the bishop with the movements of the queen. However, we can also internally compare what the pawn can do with what the pawn cannot do. These comparative standards are the outcome of the social effect created by our conventions and conceptual relations. And here I must stress this view was also at least indirectly inspired from Floyd's view of technique and aspect that we also use these not only as methods for constructing conventions themselves, but they also become operators inside the social games that we play. A reasonable explanation for such linguistic phenomena is a notion of social effect embedded in our form of life and scaffolded by the autonomy of grammar and interdependence with salva regula. And again, I stress interdependence and not relation. And uh, I believe that's time. Since I do have one minute, I would like to uh, skip to the conclusive remarks. So researchers that hold an atheistic paradigm are going to ascribe a humane framework to Wittgenstein and defer to naturalism in some form. In contrast, theists are going to commit to a transcendental Wittgenstein and find a Kantian justification to their use of form of life. 
If we have yet not yet noticed the meaninglessness in Wittgenstein's original use and the semantic plasticity which gave rise to this dilemma and their consequential implications, then we have been talking past each other for decades and we are going to continue doing so as well. If Wittgenstein had a clear intention to illustrate this notion as either transcendental or cultural, he would have done so. The efforts of Wittgenstein scholars to find the needle in the haystack and overinterpret the form of life as either cultural or transcendental necessitate the exegetical leaps and reasons which are not demanding of the primary literature. If the emphasis was not intended to be on our human form of life, Wittgenstein himself could have easily written form of culture or transcendental form of X, or X is the favorite externality of the interpreter. Okay, that uh, would be it from me. Thank you very much uh, for offering me the chance to speak with you. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, so uh, before the next section, we have, I think, have a 15 minutes break. Okay, you can hear me now. Uh, so. I would now like to briefly introduce our next speaker, uh, David Palme, uh, who is actually one of our co-organizers and who is going to give his presentation now. David Palme is uh, currently a PhD student at uh, Max Weber Kolleg in Erfurt, and um, his PhD project being on contradiction as a form of life. Um, David is interesting, uh, interested in uh, theories of moral justification and as regards the role of Wittgenstein's philosophy in his PhD project, I would I would just like to um, say that he is uh, offering a reading of Wittgenstein, which relates Wittgenstein to critical theory of society, and uh, this uh, is something that he is, of course, more able to tell you more about than I can. So. David, uh, thank you for, for uh, being one of the presenters today, and uh, you have the microphone now. And maybe I'll just uh, mention that you also, David also um, has also up uploaded his presentation on chat. So you can also follow, download the presentation and uh, follow that way. Okay, so David, uh, you have the microphone. Yeah, hello everyone. And uh, thank you, Danka. And yeah, thanks for everyone for being here and the other speakers for giving their talks and participating in our um, workshop series here. Um, yes, I uploaded my, my presentation and also my script into the chat so that you could follow. I think I will not share my screen um, because like actually the presentation is just some of the longer quotes that I read out uh, anyways. But um, if you wanna like reread them quickly, you can just like um, have a look at the presentation um, and maybe I will like um, make it like hovering when we upload the uh, presentation later. Um, yeah, okay, I go, go right into it. Um, let's understand crisis and this talk is about, in a way about crisis as a loss of agreement and form of life, to quote Wittgenstein here. So as a loss of certainty about what we do and how we do it, a crisis, such as the COVID-19 pandemic disrupts our everyday life and changes the continuity of our actions. By dealing with the present countermeasures during the pandemic and its consequences in the aftermath, things change. There's a lot of talk about how there will be ultimately be no return to normality, but a new normality to which we will have to adapt. In Germany, for instance, there was and still is a discussion whether the strict countermeasures, including to restrict or forbid gatherings of all kinds, would turn Germany into an authoritarian state. The concern was usually dismissed by saying, no, we won't because we are not like that. Um, and the question is on what reservoir of reasons are such claims drawn? Um, yeah. My talk will elaborate on this topic, let's say, uh, in the light of the series of letters between Ludwig Wittgenstein and Piero Sraffa in 1934, one of which was just uh, has just recently been published in the Nordic Wittgenstein Review by Moa Diaco. Um, in it, Wittgenstein tries to clarify some points of a discussion they had whether his home country, Austria, would become fascist. One could say Wittgenstein, and, or one could, and I do, uh, say that Wittgenstein fights an idea of a triad of us, our life, and crisis. Um, where us is based in an unchangeable reservoir of a collective mentality of a people, as he says. Um, and 
in regard to the other talks that we just heard, one could say that um, Wittgenstein in the letters also like investigates a misleading picture he gives himself and he, he looks in which ways it is misleading and in which way it actually works. And um, what, yeah, I, I think this would, is an interesting connection. Um, and instead uh, of this triad, um, Wittgenstein argues that what we call mentality is nothing more than a particular sum of phenomena, phenomena of our life. He compares it with the, the, with the face of a person, which is sometimes called a mirror of the soul. However, it is a product of muscle concentration and yet those can be the result of our behavior. We often tell your face when we often yell, our face has different wrinkles than when we laugh a lot. Um, yes, my talk will also argue that um, his argument here is in accord with some remarks that he later, or that are later published in philosophical investigations. Um, most importantly, yes, a paragraph around 240 um, and the so-called private language argument. Although I will not go very deep into detail here and stay with the letters most of the time. Um, and for COVID, I will also use examples mostly from Germany and Austria, where I'm currently am. Where, well, wherever you are, things might be a little different. So please keep that in mind. And I also assume that you have like a basic knowledge about fascism, national socialism, and the crimes and atrocities committed by them. If you don't, there might be some misunderstandings in, about what I'm going to say. So please bring this up if you get confused. Um, I know that not everyone learns about this in school and on top of that a lot of my research is centered around the Holocaust and its lasting impact. So I might sometimes forget that not everyone is fam as familiar with these horrors as I am. Okay, so enough of the disclaimer. Um, yeah, let me begin to illustrate with an anecdote from German politics. In 2017, so three years ago, the German Minister of the Interior created some media attention by attempting to define German light culture. This means to define the core of what it means to be a German citizen. This is something that prominent figures of the German right attempt on occasion, and that always freaks out a lot of people. However, the first of his 10 theses about German light culture um, was about social customs, some social customs that express a certain mentality, most importantly, he names two. We shake hands as a greeting and we show our faces. In 2017, this was mostly out of a chauvinist anti-Muslim sentiment because he adds after the thing about the faces, we don't do the Volker. Today, in mid-2020, besides the irony, one might wonder, have we forsaken German light culture by wearing face masks and not shaking hands anymore? Have we lost our way, our core of culture? One, one could ask if this would be true. Um, and in the third session of our online workshop, so in the last one, Alfred Nordmann also briefly mentioned these everyday rituals, such as shaking hands. Um, and he said, as a counterpoint, one could say, of course, we do not give up our form of life when we stop shaking hands, because we still agree and decided in language by using language, and we still agreed in using this language, to give up this particular practice for a limited period of time. But I think it's uh, worth a closer look than just like to be um, this quick about it. So, in 1934, Ludwig Wittgenstein has, has had a discussion with his friend and colleague Piero Straffer, an Italian economist at Cambridge University. Um, and before I go into context of these letters, let me point out what I think is the main thesis of Wittgenstein here. Quote, now the fallacy which I want to point out is this, to think every action which people do is preceded by a particular state of mind of which the action is the outcome, end of quote. Wittgenstein gives several examples to illustrate this claim. He considers fashion, um, and ask, why does the fashion of dressing change? He says, most people would answer, because the taste changes. Wittgenstein considered this a fallacy, because in reality, quote, people dress as they do for lots of different reasons, end of quote. They wear, they wear the dresses and suits the tailor provides that are fitting for their tasks, etc. Also, the tailor produces the dressing they think might sell, for which they have the materials, etc. 
their taste, whatever that may be, has, has a very little role in all of this. Especially if one conceives it as a mental reservoir, some kind of private sensation or judgment inside, inside of the mind or the collective mentality of a people. Instead, Wittgenstein suggests that a change of fashion is the change of dressing. A change of taste is the change of what people dress. And what we call fashion, what we call taste, is a description of what people do. So it's like, um, yeah, we are inclined to call the cause of an action, what we like calling the cause of an action, is in fact a description of this action or of the change of it. It's a product of the change of it. Um, so the sequence is the other way around than one would usually um, assume. Um, but the actual topic of the discussion is not fashion, but the question whether Wittgenstein's home country, Austria, would become fascist in 1933. Um, oh. The Austrians had considered themselves already during the 19th century as a kind of Germans. The sentiment becomes very stronger after the First World War, and a lot of them dreamed about a unification, actually. Um, just, um, yeah. And as you may know, in the election of 1933, the Nazi party becomes the strongest in German parliament and a huge majority of Nazis, centrist nationalists, and even some social Democrats voted for Hitler as chancellor. So as a head of government and also gave him the power to rule without the parliament. As Hitler himself was Austrian by birth, the chances for unification rose and a lot of people in both countries were looking forward to it, even if this would happen under the sign of fascism. To be honest, one could assume that the Wittgenstein family considered themselves patriotic and this meant at this time that they were in favor of unification with Germany as well. But on the same side, we know at least later um, from, for example, from the, uh, it's, it's written about in a biography of, of Monk about Wittgenstein, that they were, they worried a lot because they knew that uh, the Nazis regarded them as Jews and then when the unification actually happened in 1938, uh, yeah, 83, 38, um, this caused them a lot of problems. So what sparked the discussion between Sraffa and Wittgenstein must have been a comment um, of the kind that he could not imagine Austria being fascist, something like this. And Sraffa must have given a very technical answer of the kind, well, if this and that economical factors change, then it might become fascist because fascism is a form of government and the Austrians can do as well whatever the Germans do. So why do you say that they could not possibly do that? Um, and Sraffa must have said something like, do you really think it is incompatible with their mentality? Um, and then Wittgenstein clarifies that he meant it literally. He could, he could not imagine Austria being fascist he could not create a picture in his mind how it would look and feel. Because even if he agrees that fascism is a form of government that could be implemented in Austria as well, the Austrians would be fascist in just a slightly different way than the Germans would be. And um, yeah, as we know from history, he was right about this. So what I want to highlight here is that this is why um, they discuss mentality as a kind of mental reservoir. Wittgenstein insists that there, there is nevertheless a use for this kind of talk. So of this kind of talk this of mentality or whatever. He calls a phenomenon, he wants to grasp also the physiognom physiognomy or the face of a people. What makes it actually weirder, consider the racism we're talking about, but I think it's well become clear why I still consider Wittgenstein no, no, not to be a racist. He states in a recently rediscovered letter that he means by mentality a sum of phenomena of all kinds of sorts one can absorb, and more importantly, that an unscientific onlooker would notice and remember the most, like one would, would remember features of the face of a person. This fact is the source of the fallacy I quoted um, before. To take the mentality as the cause for people's actions when it's actually just the surface of these actions. Wittgenstein is not denying the fact that different nations do a lot of things differently, but these differences are not expression of fixed mentalities, 
of an ethnic essence of a, or spirit or race or such, such a thing, but for lots of different reasons. People are doing this and that, and that creates the picture of their mentality. This face of a people is not the source of the actions. Nevertheless, Wittgenstein claims it is absolutely legitimate to make assumptions about people based on our impressions of their mentality, to predict how they will react or what they will do and what not, might be as, ac as accurate as the weather forecast of a person who, quote, has had lots of experience of the weather in these di districts, end of quote. But of course, it is not meteorology. Um, yeah, I think Wittgenstein is hovering around an idea he is expressing also in the philosophical investigations and on, in uncertainty. What he calls the physiognomy of a people is an impression of what they take for certain, or better, what we take for certain, they take for certain. So it's less, and here maybe this is in addition to what Andre talked about, that form of life is not just like, a, for example, a thing that not truth maker or something, but it's also important as a, as he says, as the background for not our 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 um, propositions make sense, but also the background we assume for the background um, of other people's assertions um, and propositions. In the philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein drops an important distinction in paragraph two hundred forty one that between agreement and opinion and agreement and form of life. The former being something like holding the same statement for truth, the later, uh, latter being something like acting in accordance, for example, just like Cox interlock in a machine. They, so to speak, yeah, agree in a way. Wittgenstein is more interested in this latter agreement and form of life. This agreement is the same as the certainty with which I follow a rule that means I'm certain that the next step in the sequence is this and that. To agree in language means to take the same things for certain. As one can infirm from paragraph 238, so just like um, three remarks before that, um, of the agreement in form of life, where he, where he talks about um, that it's certain that a specific thing has a specific color. Um, this was also mentioned in Andre's talk, I think. And that when he comes back to this in paragraph 241, that agreement and form of life, that this is not an agreement and opinion, that this has the color, but yeah, an agreement and form of life in continuous conduct or in practice, um, as is the word in uh, way, way earlier in uh, 201 and 202, where he says there has to be another way of grasping a rule that is not an interpretation, so that we cannot just like add um, uh, after interpretation, but there is another way of grasping the rule, and this is like practice acting. And a notorious example for this would be the teacher and the students counting over 1000 in paragraph 185. It's yeah, very um, vivid, this picture and how they agree or disagree in the way of counting. And what I want to say is that the group of people that interacts in, a, in, a, in this way, so they agree in, in their actions, so they live together, display a physiognomy. This is what Wittgenstein was writing to Sraffa. So I suggest that the form and form of life is actually like the, meant like as form, as in shape of a face or yeah, what physiognomy actually means, so like the physis of, of a phenomenon. The form of life then is also not an essence, essence of language as such, as some suggested or is describing essential features of language, but literally the form of the use of certain language games in the life of a group of people. And this um, use of a certain language games is important, I think, because this is in detail in the letters, um, that Wittgenstein is writing that the physiognomy is not based on the totality of phenomena of a people, but on a selection of them. He writes, and this is of the newly uh, published letter, that this cannot be found in the uh, Wittgenstein and Cambridge collection of letters. When I went on to talk about the mentality of a people, he writes, I meant a particular selection of their actions. 
So a sum of observed, a sum of observed phenomena, not the sum of observable phenomena. And he points out the selection even might not include the most important ones to understand the life of a nation, but we are tempted to consider this selection of features as a source of actions and change as a subject of the life of a nation. And this is wrong. This is the fallacy that he wants to point out actually more to himself than to, to, to Sraffa maybe. Um, and this, even when we talk about the very important phenomenon, because this is like what we remember the most about a, a group of people uh, or yeah, nation, as he says, um, it might still be just a small number of prominent features. And I would like to consider this as well for the term form of life, so that it, a form of life is never about the totality of language games, not the totality of language as such, but it's always like about the selection of language games that are imagined as a whole. So the term form of life is as physiognomy, a tool of description, not, um, not like an abstract object, actually. So let me now go briefly back to the themes of light culture crisis and COVID. To the former German minister of the interior, we might now say with Wittgenstein, your attempt of describing the basic core of German culture is not and cannot be a description of a mental reservoir that all Germans share. If there's such a thing as light culture, it has to be based on actual observation. And for example, if women in Boca become part of our everyday life, they have to be part of such a description. But what the minister said can also be regarded as the expression of a wish he has. It should be like this, as when I look into the mirror and wish my belly would be flatter. But one could also say the minister shows a face himself by trying to describe the face of the Germans in general. It is the face of the part of the nation that wants it that way, but it is a face of a part. So it's not, yeah, I cannot stress this enough. So this is, and it, I think it's an, interesting um, way of applicate this um, notion. So it is one thing to describe the fashion by saying after your PhD you attend conferences and formal dressing and another way another thing to say your dressing shows you do not belong here. Um, I'm not aiming at a union difference of descriptive and normative as one might suggest because also the difference I want to highlight is not that one statement might encompass more people than the other. Both take part for the whole, and that's okay. But the first describes the physiognomy of a conference and it might neglect some attendees, while the second describes the face of some attendees that neglect others. And these, this, these are two different things. Um, yeah. By having a particular impression of the physiognomy of something, you show a particular physiognomy yourself. That's why Sraffa called Wittgenstein naive when he first misunderstood him that Austria couldn't become fascist. So in a nutshell, to talk about light culture says more about yourself than about the culture you are describing. However, you might be part of that culture and in this way still be describing the culture. Um, another thing we can take from this discussion is that Wittgenstein seems to reject the idea that a crisis is a thing that hits a people and depending on their mental reservoir, they react in this or that way to a crisis. So to take the mental reservoir as a pivot of change or to use the words of uncertainty as the hinges of the fate of a people. Wittgenstein calls this a fallacy because the mentality of a people is a picture of his life and not a source of its action. Of course, we can assume based on our prior observation, based on our picture, how they will react, but we might consider the fact that it will be their mentality that changes. So whether a crisis changes the life of a nation or not depends on how much the life is actually changed and in what regards. I want to bring attention to another detail here, that our picture of the face of a nation is based on a selection of phenomena becomes relevant in two regards. First, it might so our picture might be based on elements unchanged by the crisis, and there's a number of reasons for this, but it doesn't mean that beneath the face, a lot of things actually change or did not change. Second, it might be based on overrated or overcome phenomena. Wittgenstein gives the examples that our, uh, example, that our idea of monarchy is linked to a person wearing a crown 
But of course, there could be monarchies without crowns. So the abandonment of the crown does not signify an end of monarchy. The crisis at hand, the pandemic, has shown it all. Disruption of our everyday life of a lasting effect and changes that turned out to be less disruptive than we first thought. Maybe we never go back to the ubiquitous handshake, but if we don't, it is another question whether it is due to corona or maybe the handshake was overcome already before, but just now we realize it. I want to bring one last thing from this discussion, uh, to this discussion, and this is both directed against the idea of Wittgenstein as a quietist, it came up several times in our first three sessions of this series, and instead in favor of Wittgenstein as a philosopher full of hope and yearning for a change in form of life for the best. Um, whatever, whatever change happens, crisis or not, the change of mentality or physiognomy of a people is based mostly on what we do, not the virus or the coal supplies change our face, but we do, it's up to us. So um, to, to COVID, of course, the virus and people dying from it has a huge impact on a lot of lives and a lot of lives go on differently. But what disrupts the most our everyday life is not the virus itself, but the countermeasures. So something we do to ourselves. Um, yeah, so I want to close with one last quote from this time from the remarks of the Foundations of Mathematics that was probably written in 1938, so the time when Othra already had become fascist or was very soon to be incorporated in the German Reich. And Wittgenstein writes, um, the sickness of a time is cured by a change in the way of living of, the, of a people, of the people's uh, living. And it was possible, only possible, for the sickness of philosophical problems to get cured by a change in thinking and living, not through a medicine invented by an individual. I believe and hope that the future generation will laugh at this hopeless focus. Yeah, thank you for your attention and I hope that you could follow. Thank you, David, for this inspiring talk on, and for this final quote uh, that I think sums it up nicely. Um, we are now um, actually um, 13 people participating.